Awesome talk for you in just a few moments, but we have to cover a few ground rules first. Um, if you could please all silence your cell phones, um, but you don't have to turn them off. We encourage you to live tweet, use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff. Um, also, if you have a passport, stickers will be issued at the back door at the end of the talk. Um, and this will be photographed and filmed, so if you have a problem with that, um, please find a seat somewhere towards the back. Um, and without further ado, I will now introduce our speaker. Steve Huffman is co-founder of Reddit.com, a social news site in one of the largest communities online. Steve created Reddit with his college roommate, Alexis Ohanian. Reddit was initially funded by Y Combinator in 2005 and has grown to over 5, 5 billion excuse me, <laughs> page views and 100 million visitors per month. In October of 2006, Reddit was acquired by Condé Nast Publications. In 2010, Huffman co-founded Hipmunk, a travel search site that aims to take the agony out of finding plane tickets in hotels online. Hipmunk has been named to Time Magazine's top 50 websites and top 10 smartphone apps. Steve was named to Inc. Magazine's 30 Under 30 in 2011 and Forbes 30 Under 30 in, 30 under 30 in 2012. Steve is a 2005 graduate of U University of Virginia. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Steve Huffman. Thank you, Chase. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Is the mic working? I can't tell down here. Yes, yes great, okay. Um, I guess we could have tested that out sooner. Um, so, um, I'm Steve. This is actually the third time I've spoken here, and it's always been a ton of fun. Um, in fact, UVA, where I went to school, is having a hackathon this weekend, but I'm here instead. Um, I'm actually I'm going down there on Sunday, because I was thinking maybe I, I don't even know if I want to go to that, but I can't, like, blow it off completely while I'm at Penn State. Um, so anyway, thank you guys for having me. It's a ton of fun. Uh, so I'm going to talk today. I think the title of my talk is like when to sell or something like that. Um, but I'm going to talk more about just lessons I've learned and uh, mistakes I've made over the last eight or so years of being in startups, one of which was like selling at probably the exact wrong time. Um, and it should be fun. And then I'll try to leave a bunch of time for QA at the end because that's pretty fun. Uh, definitely fun for me. I hope it's fun for you guys. We've seen that fun the last couple of years. So, um, so let's start with Reddit. Um, I'll give a little background on basically how Reddit came to be. Uh, my college roommate, Alexis Ohanian, you guys may have seen him speak a couple months ago or something like that. He's basically a professional speaker now. Um, he's the really charming, like charismatic one. Um, so, and he does like really fancy presentations. You don't get any of that from me, I'm sorry. Um, but, so we started Reddit together. Uh, it's kind of a long story how we actually got into Y Combinator because we had a completely different idea that was initially rejected and then we managed to like kind of wiggle our way back in. I'm not gonna go to that whole story today because I've already told that story twice here. Um, but basically when we started Reddit, we knew nothing. I was 21. Um, I had always wanted to start a company. I didn't really know the first thing about it. I was in Y Combinator really for the only reason, and the only reason I was in Y Combinator really was because I wanted to be near Paul Graham. I was like a big fan of his. I didn't, Y Combinator wasn't really a name brand yet. We were in that very first batch. There was only eight startups I think accepted and seven actually finished. And three of them basically turned into Reddit. Uh, so we, we were just, didn't know anything about anything. I could barely, I could program, I barely knew HTML, I didn't know any SQL, I didn't know anything about hiring or managing or raising or nothing. We we're just happy to be here. Um, and so my motivation at the time was I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to look stupid in front of my parents who are wondering like, what am I doing with my time? Like, why don't I have a job? Because um, I had actually I had a pretty good job all through college as a programmer, and that was going to turn into a full-time thing in Virginia. And I actually I think signed an offer letter, and then basically at the end at the end of college I was like, guys, I'm actually not going to work with you. I'm going to go on this adventure. Which having had a couple people do that to me now, is super annoying. Um, so um, that's that's let's start let's call that lesson one. Actually, I'm not going to number the lessons because I'll lose count, but uh, that's a lesson. When you sign an offer letter, you should show up. And if you don't plan on showing up, you shouldn't sign the offer letter. Because otherwise, it's very disruptive. Um, 
So uh, anyway, yeah, so I just wanted to like, you know, not look like a dummy, you know, just, just kind of get along. So Alexis and I, we started working on Reddit. Um, the way we worked in the first uh, couple of months, we share this apartment in Medford, Massachusetts, is we basically put our, our desks together, such like so we'd face each other, you know, we could kind of play footsie under the desk, and we would just sit there and I'd program all day, and he would do Alexis things. Um, he, at the time, did all the design. We were talking constantly about like different product ideas, things we could do, things that, you know, that'd be fun to try. Um, we played a lot of Warcraft. We, I don't know, we basically sat in those chairs for three months straight. I lost a ton of weight. Um, like, I was skinnier then than I am now. I'm still a pretty skinny guy, I guess. Um, but I lost like 15 pounds, probably. I was like nothing. I was wasting away because we barely ate. Because um, we didn't, I didn't, I never really bought groceries before. It was, too, it was just such a pain. So we were just like in for the ride. And Reddit started to actually work, you know, over that summer. We started to get some users. It was like a fun thing. Again, our motivation really all the way through August was don't want to look stupid. Don't want to look stupid. Let's just, you know, and, and I've, I've told that story a number of times about how we faked all of our traffic in the beginning. Um, Alexis and I would submit all of the content ourselves. Um, between the two of us, we probably had 100 accounts, and we were just trying to, like, make believe, hey, this thing is working. Um, but then eventually, you know, towards the end of that summer, it actually was working. And then that's, that's when our motivation kind of flipped a little bit. And we're like, it's working. This is a real business. And all of a sudden, like for the first time, we were confronted with the fact that maybe we need to start like treating it like a business. Um, so fast forward, we changed apartments a couple of times. So that was in 2005, the summer of 2005. The, um, spring of 2006, we moved into this new apartment in Davis Square, which was like a really kind of hip happening place to be in Boston. It was tons of fun. Um, and the dynamic of our company started to change. You know, before it was me and Alexis just in this room together all the time. Like we were basically married and inseparable. And this is the first time I've actually really kind of synthesized this thought because the tone of the company started changing. Um, I had my own room on one side of the apartment. Alexis had his own room on the other side of uh, on, on the other side of the apartment. And we actually very rarely saw each other. Um, Aaron Swartz had joined us. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Aaron is. He has been part of a lot of things in the internet, um, one of which was Reddit. Um, he had joined us a few months prior, and him and I were working together on Reddit. Um, and he lived in this apartment with us. But at this point, he had kind of lost interest in Reddit. It wasn't really his baby to begin with. And so he would stay in his room, I would stay in my room, and Alexis was in his. Um, and we weren't communicating very well. And actually the company, like, even though it was growing, and Reddit is this like, happy, fun place online, internally we were like, not in a good place in hindsight. It was, um, I was super stressed out. There, um, there was actually four of us. The fourth was Chris Slow, who um, at the time was finishing his PhD at Harvard and was working just nights with us. And, we had lived with him for a few months, but also in this new apartment, he moved in with his girlfriend. So we didn't see him at all either. He would go to work during the day, come home at night, and work on kind of Reddit side projects. At the time, it was the big recommendation engine. So it's basically four people not really communicating, just trying to hang in there, get this site going. We didn't know anything about raising money. We didn't know anything about hiring. Um, and I was basically the only engineer working on Reddit day to day. And I had this site that's just like kind of blowing up underneath me, and I didn't know what I was doing. I spent most of my time those days just, you know, trying to stay ahead of the cheaters. You know, that was a big problem on Reddit, people trying to cheat their stuff up to the front page, which is like a nice first world problem to have that people care enough to do so, but it's also like a big um, time suck away for me. And it became very demoralizing. Alexis's mom was diagnosed with cancer. Um, also around that time, and he was just in another place, as one, you know, as one would expect. So we were running out of money. We had raised, I think, at that point, a total of $70,000, you know, $12,000 from my combinator for that first summer, which is just like a comically small amount of money now. Um, and then we raised, it was $80,000, yes, because we raised another seventy dollars from Paul Graham personally. Um, 
towards the end of that first summer. We're starting to run out of money. I mean, we were running a pretty cheap, right? We're running this like fairly large website on nothing. I'm just paying our rent, not eating a whole lot of food, doing the best we could. So this guy from Condé Nast approached us named Karosh. And Karosh um, basically, you know, just wanted to meet us. We, we flew out to San Francisco to meet with him the first time. And the meeting, basically right off the bat, he said, I'd like to buy you guys. And Aaron and I were doing most of the talking in this meeting. And we were like, nope, nope, not going to happen. Um, and we kind of talked about what our plans were, what we were doing. I don't really remember specifically anymore. But I remember when we left that meeting, Aaron and I were like, yeah, we're going to sell this company. Um, him and I had this funny relationship where we, like, we hated each other. I shouldn't say hated each other. We did not get along. Um, but we could, when we were working together, we worked together really, really well. Um, and so we went from this place where him and I were not on speaking terms in this apartment in Reddit, where like, I didn't even see him for days, to like, okay, we're going to figure out how to sell this company, and you're going to quit on day one after we sell. <laughs> and he was like, yes, yes, I can leave, and it'll be great. And like, it was so fucked up, like, looking back on it, like, <laughs> like what we're going through. I, I cannot believe, it's so funny looking at that time, and, and Reddit, and then looking at what Reddit is now. Um, so, um, so we told Karosh, though, we, we were not going to sell. And he's like, well, maybe you guys can run um, this, this website for us. You know, we want to make a version of Reddit that has, like, Reddit for celebrity gossip. And we're like, OK, sure. And um, Karosh was like, well, OK, you guys just think of a business plan. Tell us how much you think it costs to, like, you know, do this thing, and then we'll, we'll figure it out. So, me, Aaron, and Alexis were thinking, instead of like, giving them a number for like, how much it would cost to like, run lipstick.com, which is like zero dollars, we told them, we, were, we basically worked back and looked at Reddit's like, how much it costs to run Reddit and pay ourselves and live in this apartment. Um, and we were, um, came up with this number, I think it was like 50 grand a month or something like that. So we go to Karosh and we're like, lipstick.com is gonna cost 50 grand a month. And he was like, Okay, and we're like yes, like <laughs> we're, Reddit can stay in business. We were like per perilously close to like running out of money and just quitting, and like we were just so like I don't know what we think we we're doing. We're just kind of like wandering around, like stumbling into one thing after another, and managed to keep this business alive. Um, so one thing to know is almost all acquisitions, not almost all, many 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 acquisitions, except for the ones you read about, the huge ones, start off as business deals. Um, Whenever you find yourself, if you're at a startup and you're working with a company, that is a potential acquirer. Um, and so if you want to get bought, that's a great way to do it. Although I would say a side lesson, which is you should never build a company to sell because you won't sell. People can kind of sniff that out. So um, we start doing this lift.com thing. Karosh is persistent, persistent, persistent on wanting to buy us. And so finally, I, him and I were chatting over IM one day, and he was like, what would it take you know, to sell Reddit. And so I just kind of like thought about how much money I wanted to make. And then I just kind of like took into account taxes and all that other stuff. And, you know, my share, because we had to split it, you know, amongst the, the three of founders. Um, we, we had made Aaron, a, we, we made him an equal shareholder when he joined us. Um, and I just told Karosh that number. And he was like, okay. And so that was basically the start of our diligence period during Reddit. This is probably in the summer of 2006. And the diligence took forever, like forever, considering the size of this deal. And Aaron was a real stickler for legalese, like just so difficult to work with. Um, a thorn in everybody's side during this time. And it's kind of his nature, right? He just, he doesn't trust anybody. And so we spent so much time hammering out these contracts. Meanwhile, our traffic doubled during that time. Um, and this is one of the things, like when I look back on it, Karosh and I would joke later, because he would talk about like, how to awesome, what an awesome deal he got. And I was kind of, you know what, like, damn it, man, you really hosed us. And he's like, yeah, well, you didn't know anything. I was like, yeah, I guess fair is fair. Um, but so another important lesson is if you're selling a company um, and you agree on a price and then the traffic doubles, you should probably ask for more money. Um, you know. What are you going to do? Um, so we sold. We went to Condé. 
I had a three-year contract at Condé, so I worked on Reddit for another three years. And that's when Reddit went through tons and tons of growth. We had, it was nice. We had this um, uh, n n nice little... Nice little situation where, where we could just kind of run the business comfortably. And that's when I learned a ton, a ton of very, very important lessons. So when I left Reddit in 2009, right at the end of my contract, um, and, and Reddit was just massive at this time, and, and, and even now it's like much, much bigger than it was then. Um, there was a number of things when I look back that I would have done differently um, that I didn't do because just didn't know any better. Collectively, the, none of us knew better. Why Comnair didn't really even know better per se, because um, their, their advice in the very early days was basically, VCs are, are the worst. Don't raise VC money. Do it on your own. Figure it out. You know, raise from angels. Do that sort of thing. Um, but what we should have done, and if I had my mind now, back then, we would have looked around and we would have said, we need to raise money. We're going to take our awesome growth numbers to investors and we're going to raise a shit ton of money. And that's going to allow us to hire. Because I think our chief problem, or one of our main problems, right, is um, we only had one person really 100% focused on the business, and I was going insane. Um, you know, Alexis and I, we stopped having the product conversations that we used to have every day. And then Aaron was locked in his room, and I was just trying to keep the site online. We just weren't making progress. But if we had raised money, we could have hired. And hiring is the key to almost all of those woes. It would have freed us up to think about bigger things. What do we want to do with the site? Where, what direction are we going to take it? You know, Alexis and I might have a few minutes to like, take a look at our relationship and, and you know, re re repair things. Um, it would have made things so much easier. And it's like such a no-brainer. Um, but at the time, we were afraid of raising. And I remember you know, I had this idealistic notion as a, as a college kid that like, Oh, business, I, you know, I looked at this VC world, and I was like, you shouldn't have to raise. You can just bootstrap and do it yourself. That's a very naive way of thinking, you know, because capital allows you to grow faster than you would otherwise. And your competitors are probably raising capital. So, um, you know, and our competitor at the time was Dig, right? Dig was doing a much more, running a much more mature company as a business. You know, they, they knew what they were doing. Their product sucked, in my opinion. Um, but as a business, they really had their shit together. At least it appeared to, right? At least they raised money and hired and had a team and designers and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and, and that, that like, I don't know how we survived that, to be honest with you, because um, if you don't raise, your competitors will raise, and then they will have this massive unfair advantage over you. Um, and that's what they did. Dig, Dig for a long time, um, was basically, they were seven times bigger than us for the entire, entirety of Dig until the day they committed suicide. Um, and, I mean, that was a gift. I always had in my head, like, I kind of suspected they were, like, I knew Reddit was better. I just, I just knew it. Um, you know, everybody who uses Reddit knows about Dig, but they use Reddit instead. But the inverse isn't true, right? There's tons of Dig users who didn't know about Reddit. So I just knew we were better, but I wasn't behaving like we were better. Um, so, um, yeah, raising would have helped a ton. Um, you know, you can't do, the other big mistake I made, I've kind of come at this from a couple different angles, is I was trying to do everything myself. Um, those last few months when I was burning out, before we sold, um, I was trying to do all the engineering, I was trying to do all the product work, I was trying to, I was doing all the operations, like sysadmin stuff, I, I, was, I was trying to do everything. I, I very rarely asked Alexis for help. Um, he would, you know, he, he was running like this different side of the business that was, um, you know, keeping users happy, t-shirts, marketing, evangelism, making us friends, like, you know, occasionally I think trying to get product ideas in, but I think I just kind of shut, shut myself off, which um, I think held, held us back there for a while. Um, you know, the other side effect of raising is you bring in um, other, other brains into your company, like people who've been around a while, mentors and advisors. You know, some VCs are dumb, but most are not, actually. Most are actually very, very smart. And they could have taken these, like, 22-year-old kids and forced some knowledge on them. Like, here's how you should be doing things. Like, there's, there's some obvious things that you guys are neglecting that you guys would fix. So um, I think that's a really important thing, is, is when you're starting a company, one of the side effects of raising is just bringing in intelligence, bringing in maturity, mentors, people who are going to tell you, you know, just 
help you navigate because the business world's complicated sometimes and there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of things you have to think about. If you've never done it the first time, you really just don't have any perspective. At least that was, um, that was the problem with us. We just had no perspective. So um, I left Reddit in 2009. I took a few months off and I had in mind I was going to do another startup. And I, there's some things I want to do differently. I've already spent a lot of time talking about raising. The other thing I wanted to do differently was um, I wanted to start a business that was involved in the exchange of money. It's a very like simple idea, right? Businesses, one of the reasons they exist is to make money. Reddit does not make money. Um, they barely make money now. I shouldn't say that. I think they make money. I actually don't know. Um, not a lot. Um, because like it, it's it's it, it is what it is, and we spent a lot of time towards the end of Reddit, like trying to contrive business models into this thing, and it was such a pain in the ass. And if you if you if your business is involved in the exchange of money, you, that's something you just don't have to think about anymore. Um, but on Reddit, we're like we can do ads, we can do these sponsored links. They got the Reddit Gold thing now. It's just such a, a lot of mental energy, and like how do we turn this massive influential thing into money? It's, it's like it shouldn't be that hard. Um, so. My co-founder at Hipmunk is this guy named Adam. We have been friends for a couple of years at this point. He called me in the spring of 2010. It's like, I want to do a travel search startup. And I thought, well, I agree we can make a better product. I traveled a lot. I used kayak a lot. And it just made me rage. I just have no patience for bad products. It just, I, I, it's like, uncomfortably angry. I do this a lot at Hitmunk now. I've, I've learned, um, like I watch people get like, like get afraid of me because I'm sitting at my computer just being like, what the fuck is this shit? This is like such bullshit. I'm just like trying to like, just like exploding. And I find myself, I would do that a lot. Um, just trying to buy plane tickets home. Um, like, I, I just very short temper on that sort of thing. So when Adam's like, hey, I think we should build a better like flight search thing, a travel product. I was like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. But Adam, I was like, why would we choose the most hostile space possible? You know, we have all these unfair advantages. Like I know tons of people, we can do YC if we want, we'll have no trouble raising money, getting press, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, why, why, why are we setting ourselves up with this like huge like disadvantage being in the travel space? The travel space is really weird, um, by the way. I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit, but he's very, very persistent. He was at the time the reigning North American debate champion. So I didn't really, stand a chance in that argument. Um, and so I basically, I, I, was, I was straight with them. I said, you know, I'll do this thing with you. Um, you know, it'll be fun. I'll do my best. And in three months, when we can't get this thing off the ground, we'll just work on something else. And he was like, OK, deal. And, and so that was, that, was, that was my attitude at the time. I was like, I'm a professional. I know I can build a good product. And I know we're not going to get it off the ground. And so we can just do something later. And um, so we started working on Hitmunk, and I, um, we did the same thing. You know, I tried to take the things from Reddit that I thought worked really well. So him and I worked in our apartment. We put our desks together, um, faced each other, and we would just sit there and like jive about product ideas all day. Because we, we didn't actually know what the product was going to be. We just know it was going to be better than Kayak. Um, and Kayak was, still is, like, I don't know, kind of, sort of. They were like our dig. Um, and I still actually feel the same way. Like, every Hitmunk user knows about Kayak and uses us instead. And the inverse is not true. So we just got to make sure the other ones you know, find out about us. Unfortunately, I don't think Kayak, Expedia, Priceline, Orbitz, Skyscanner are all going to commit suicide like Dig did. Um, although Travelocity just did, so we'll see. <laughs> One down. <laughs> um, but um, so at Hitmunk, though, I was like, OK, we're involved in exchange of money. Good, that's lesson one. I'm going to have a much like better co-founder relationship. You know, Alexis and I never talked about our roles. Um, so one, one of the problems we had is it, was, it wasn't ever really clear who was in charge. Um, I kind of, especially in the beginning, him and I were just like, just the world, and just always working together, talking together. I was doing the physical programming, but we talked about everything. Um, when he started to get distracted with his family things, and I started to kind of shut down, that, that I think line of communication deteriorated a little bit. And I remember saying with Hitmonk, I was like, this is not going to happen with Adam. Him and I are going to just be very open and honest with each other, and we have been. And, and that's been so important, so important. Adam and I probably have a blow-up argument at each other about once a month, um, mostly one side where I'm just like lose my shit and I'm just like yelling at him, like, why can't you do this? And then I, 
I don't know, God bless him, like he, like, he always comes back the next day and he's like, you know, you were right. And I was like, well, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'll just be a total asshole. Um, but we have a much better relationship and a very clear division of labor, and I think that's helped us through a lot of the tough times. Because Hitmonk is a tough business, we're in a tough space. You know, he runs the business side of things. He does all of our negotiating, he's got his whole team over there. He's basically like the external leader of the company. And, and that's, that's what we talk about. And then I do the engineering and the product, and I am the internal leader of the company. And that's, that's very clear. Everybody at Hitmonk knows that, that's how we operate, and there's no, like, there's no mistake. And when Adam and I are talking to someone on our team, we're always in agreement. Like there is never a time when Adam and I, eh, okay, never so, not exactly accurate, but almost always him and I are in, in lockstep. And it's worked out so well. But we have to do that really deliberately. I've seen so many startups fail because the co-founders can't get their shit together. They're like trying to do different things. They don't agree. There's ego issues. Like it's just so many startups fail because of that. And it's such an easy thing to get right. All you have to do, the secret to all relationships, is communication. And we just communicate a lot at a very high level. Uh, so Hitmonk's a totally different situation, right? We've raised $20 million so far, you know, compared to Reddit's 82,000, um, which has meant we've been able to hire a ton of people. We have really great investors. And what hiring, you know, now I've learned all of these, made all these, a new class of mistakes, you know? Going from Reddit to Hitmonk, my, my mentality was, okay, I've learned all of these mistakes at Reddit. Fortunately, we came out on top. You know, I'm very lucky about that, considering like, what, a, what donkeys we were. Um, and I'm gonna uh, take all those lessons, apply them to Hitmonk, and we're gonna be great. But the thing is, like, Reddit was only six people at its largest when I was there. Um, you know, and I was still doing all the work at Reddit. I didn't realize that was a mistake yet. Um, and so at Hitmonk, uh, you know, we, we did the fundraising thing, we did the, um, you know, advisors and mentors, good relationship with the co-founder, but I started making like, we started hiring and I'm still doing all the work. And that's been a very important lesson at Hitmonk. I think that's held us back a little while, um, was like learning how to delegate and how to actually manage and how to like try to take a step back. It's still something I really, really struggle with, but you know, there's a whole other side, the whole new class of problems. Um, as, as you scale, as you have more people, as you have higher expectations. Um, you know, getting people to believe in what you believe in is actually a really difficult thing. And it's something we spend, Adam and I spend a lot of time talking about, is like, how do we get people to feel as passionate about our flight and hotel product, right? It's not a very glamorous thing. I feel very passionate about it because I just like building nice things. Um, but like getting that to rub off on other people is really tricky. Um, you know, I used to think mission statements and that sort of thing were really, really cheesy, but they're actually really important. You know, you, you have this like thing everybody needs to like galvanize around. It's also, they're really important for, as like a decision making process. Um, because you've got all these moving parts, you can't be involved in everything, you can't talk to everybody, you can't control everybody. So you have to give them a framework for making decisions the way you would make decisions. And so at Hipmunk, you know, Overall, it's like we want to take the agony out of planning travel. Everything you should, you're working on should be doing that. And then we have these kind of two submissions. Number one is um, we must be solving the user's problems. And number two is we must be growing the number of users. So when somebody's like deciding between like two things to work on, you look at them and you say, does this grow the number of users? Does it solve users' problems? If it doesn't do either of those things, the answer is no, we're not gonna do it. And reminding everybody like why we are here, we are here to do these two things and to overall take the agony out of travel, that helps a lot. And we spent a lot of time just like learning how to like get people excited about this very kind of, you know, non-glamorous thing. Um, time and stress management is another thing that, you know, we kind of learned at Hitmonk the hard way. Uh, you know, this business, we've been at it almost four years now, and a lot of ups and downs, especially in, in the early days where an airline could wake up in a bad mood and just basically put us out of business. You know, when we launched, uh, we launched in August of 2010, like two days later, American Airlines was like, nope, you can't display our flights. And we're like, is this even legal? Like, are you allowed to do this to us? Turns out the answer is yes. Um, and we were just like, 
the hell? This sucks. Um, you know, we, we've, we've, you know, a number of times had to real, really scramble just to like kind of save the business. And I saw ourselves kind of slipping into this like burnout thing that I was feeling at Reddit towards the end there. And we, you know, a lot, you hear a lot about startups working like, you know, 15 hour days, 18 hour days, seven days a week, just like really getting after it. We don't do that. We are like nine to six, five days a week. I think, at least for me, and then I can't, I don't think I can ask other people to work harder if I can't. It's basically like, I need to spend the rest of my time like chilling out or just basically not working. Because um, otherwise, like, burnout is a real dangerous thing. And I think you need to keep kind of in perspective, like, if you're going to build a company for a long time, you need to be kind of mentally, you know, in it. Otherwise, otherwise the whole thing, the, the wheels will just come off the operation. So time and stress management is a big thing. You know, trying to remove things from my life that add stress um, is, is something I think about a lot. And if you know me, I, I actually do that very poorly. <laughs> um, but um, it's something I'm aware of. And I think it's, it's important for everybody to acknowledge like where their kind of um, me mental state is. Um, the other new class of problems we have is like managing our investors. You know, with raising lots of money, we have to like, now we have, you know, at, at Reddit and a lot of like, if you guys start startups, you'll have a board and you'll have board meetings, which are really where you basically send an email that said, we had a board meeting. Um, but there's no actually, like at Reddit, we never actually met. Like, there, there's just like a silly little thing. And, and I remember this concept of a board of directors seemed just very abstract and just like kind of a movie concept that didn't really exist. Um, I didn't look, we have a board. There's five of us, me, Adam, Brad, and Todd, our two main investors, and then Bob Crandall, who used to be CEO of, ironically, American Airlines. Um, he's like one of the best business minds of ever. Um, he's, we're very, very lucky to have him. But like we have this whole kind of like side chunk of work we have to do now where it's like basically managing the board. You know, we make a plan, like a revenue plan for the board. We present it. You know, we try to, you know, we, 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 we get them on, on the same page with us, you know, get, get them bought into it. And then we have to like work to execute that plan. And it's a weird, like, it's a new set of constraints we have to deal with. And it took us a long time because I used to have this attitude in those meetings of basically just like, you guys are just capital, you know, fuck you guys. I don't care about your product ideas. You know, I don't really care about our revenue numbers that much. You know, I'm just trying to build the best product I can. Quit, quit bugging me on all these other little important things. Oh, well, at the time I thought they were not important, but they're actually quite important. Um, and so we've had to learn how to behave like adults um, and do things deliberately. And we've gotten so much better at it. As a result, you know, I remember at the time when our investors were giving us trouble about, you know, just various things. I remember just being really just like, I had kind of a bad attitude. You know, I don't respond to authority very well. Um, but in the last couple of years at Hitmonk, we've learned how to measure everything, how to test everything. There's not a decision we make that isn't like, doesn't fit our mission, isn't tested ahead, has like, you know, a hypothesis for like what we think you know, feature X is going to do to growth. And then at the end, you know, a, a breakdown of, you know, kind of a, a post-mortem, you know, here's what we thought was going to happen. Here's what we did. Here's what actually happened. Here's why. Here's our next steps. And this like very disciplined cycle that it's, gosh, if I could take my knowledge and the team we have now um, and put it towards like, you know, let's, let's, let's just say for like Reddit, oh my gosh, it would be it would be so amazing. I read it, we were just like shooting from the hip all the time. And we were lucky that we were, we were right a lot, but um, having discipline and self-control and testing is just such an amazing thing. Um, it's, 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 it's really, really fun. Um, and I think it's just one of the things you kind of start to develop when you're on your you know, second, third companies. Um, so I'm trying to share it with you now. Um, and I'm, I, I hope that when you guys start your companies someday that like, some of this sticks. Um, you know, there are many, many paths to success, but I think um, there are ways of behavior that can like increase your actual odds of success. You know, like all of these guys you've heard talk all have crazy stories of how they got their stuff off the ground and managed to like stay in business. I don't know how many of you guys were in the room for Cybel's thing. Like, they were on death's door a couple of times. Um, like, you never know what you know 
the world is going to throw at you. But I think if you have a good way of making decisions and good people you trust and are very deliberate about the types of things you're doing, you'll, you'll get past those. Um, and if you don't, you're going to have to get lucky. I think at Reddit we got lucky a lot. We got lucky a lot. I'm so thankful that like we were there and you know managed to kind of get out alive. And I'm so proud of what Reddit's turned into. But I can't say we did a lot of that on purpose. Um, that's why I get very uncomfortable when people, um, you know, give Alexis and I so much credit for building Reddit. Because I just think like, man, I you know, really we just didn't fuck it up. You know, I'm very proud of that. I feel like we tried to maintain this magical thing that was growing. But it's hard to say we did it on purpose. You know, I can't say that with a straight face. We were just, we were just, we, we, we felt like we were just kind of the, the gatekeepers of this, of this neat thing. But on Hitmonk, you know, every user we have, we've like earned. Like we've found that user. We found people like them. We targeted the shit out of them on Facebook. We retargeted them again. We emailed them. We're like dynamic this and that and like really stalker, maniacal, disciplined behavior to get every one of those users to Hitmonk. Um, and that's a lot of fun. Um, I just, you know, it's, it's, it's completely different. So anyway, that's enough rambling from me. Um, let's do some questions, yeah? Yeah. Sorry, you talked a bit about people being passionate. Or yeah. So it's very different, the two companies. So the question was basically, um, how did we grow these companies organically? Um, so Reddit, uh, we launched, the way we launched was Paul Graham kind of launched us. Uh, he, he was, we were kind of his pet project in YC because you know, he rejected us first and then we like, came up with the, like, the seeds of that idea together. Um, so he was just, bugging me and bugging me and bugging me about getting the site ready and like, why is it taking so long? What the hell could you possibly be doing? Meanwhile, it's like, it's like June 22nd. I started working on June 1st. It's like, Paul, give me a break, man. It's been three weeks. Like, what do you want? Um, so when I, when I sent him an email one morning, because uh, he sent me this like nasty email about like, what the hell are you doing? Like, what a, like have I made a huge mistake? I was like, oh, Jesus, like, kind of demoralizing. Um, but I sent him this email. I was like, look, asshole. Here, I didn't say asshole, but that's what I was thinking. I was like, asshole, here's, here's the website. It's working-ish. You should see screenshots from back then, though. It like, wasn't doing anything. Um, and he like, posted it on his blog um, without telling me. Um, I think I was running on my laptop at the time. And so he kind of launched us. But Paul Graham had a pretty, pretty good following. Nothing like he has today. But at the time, he had a pretty good following of really high quality users, like these smart, techie, educated, well-read, you know, good, nice. If you're going to start a community from scratch, that's a good core of users to have. Um, and so, yeah, it just kind of grew through word of mouth. Um, Reddit never did any marketing. Um, the only marketing he did was like Alexis, right? That's like he would make friends, he would talk to people. He, um, him and I answered all the customer service emails for a while, like every single one of them. He did that for another like couple of years, you know, signing things, just lots of community outreach sort of things. But Reddit just kind of always grew organically. You know, I think. Alexis is less responsible for the growth and more responsible for the tone. You know, I think we probably would have grown. It's hard to say because um, um, the two are so intertwined. Um, so I don't really know what worked there. Um, I know I wouldn't change anything, um, but I'm not sure why it worked. Hitmonk's totally different. Um, when we launched, we had a ton of PR because it was like former Reddit guy starting companies. So we got a lot of press and initial traffic that way. Um, and and it's still a lot of our growth. Most of our growth is still organic and kind of PR and that sort of thing. But we do a ton of marketing. We spend a lot of money on marketing, um, either buying downloads. You know, we have like lots of models where it costs you know this amount of money to get an install, called CPI, cost per install, and then you know the LTV of a mobile user is X. And you know if we, you know, and then we just basically do all these things to try to increase the LTV. LTV is lifetime value. So we just have all these formulas of it costs this much to acquire a user, we make this much money from a user, and if we can do these things to make that user come back more often, we can increase the LTV and we just try to make all those equations work. Um, and then when it works, we can spend a lot more money on it. 
Um, but there are channels at Hitmonk, so you might be thinking, well, why don't you just spend an infinite amount of money to get an infinite number of users? Um, a lot of those channels, like retargeting, which is like when a user shows up to your website, you cookie them, and then you stalk them across the internet. You know? If you come to Hitmonk, you'll see Hitmonk ads all over the internet. Like, we can't do that infinitely, right? We can only do that for every user who actually makes it into the site. Um, so there's a ceiling to like, kind of sum these channels and that sort of thing. So, yeah, totally different. Good question. Yeah. So I may have missed this, but you said that you found a way to make money off of Hitmonk that was not Oh, yeah, yeah. How do you make money? Yeah, Hitmonk's business model. Yeah, it's very straightforward. When you um, book a flight or hotel, we get paid. Yeah. No, no. Um, so you click on an airline, you go to an airline's website, and you, and you buy your ticket. That airline will pay us a little bit if that user converts. Um, on a hotel, same thing. Um, we get paid a lot more in hotels because hotels aren't perpetually going out of business like airlines. Um, uh, and then if you actually book on Hitmonk, the only advantage is we actually make the same amount of money whether you book on, like, you know, if we link to Expedia and you book there or you book on Hitmonk powered by Expedia, um, we make the same amount of money. But when you book on Hitmonk, we actually know you converted. When you book on Expedia, they just, at the end of the month, basically give us a check. And, like, we don't really have any way of knowing whether, like, First of all, they won't tell us which users actually converted, which is really frustrating for our marketing efforts. Um, and you know, we goof on the analytics. I know they goof on the analytics, so it's really kind of like, are we getting the full amount? Are we getting too much? We don't really know. Um, but yeah, that's the business model. Yeah. Um, like why did like why did invest like why do we exist? Like why on their end, why is it beneficial for them to pay you money as opposed to kayak like a kayak exists? Okay, yeah. So the question is like, yeah, why do our partners pay us instead of kayak? They don't pay us instead of kayak, they pay us both. You know? They basically everybody meta search is interesting. So what meta search is is we are not a travel agency. Expedia, Priceline Orbits, they're travel agencies. They actually issue tickets. We are meta search. We just link to other people, um, we just hand users off. The benefit of this for us as a business is the airlines hate travel agencies. They hate them because they have to pay the travel agencies a ton of money. Um, and they don't get to know who the customers are. Um, whereas us, we actually give them the customer. They get to know their name, they get their email, they get to do all sorts of things like that. Um, and they know if they don't pay us that they're going to have to buy that user from Google or they're going to have to pay Kayak or they're going to have to pay whomever. So basically, everybody, airlines, OTAs, hotels are happy to pay us for those users. And they're happy to pay everybody, because they know if they don't, they're going to go somewhere else. So um, it's a nice situation to be in from that perspective. Yeah? Uh, what was the opinion about WattVision? Uh, okay, yeah, so he asked, what was my interest in WattVision, which is a company I invested in? Um, that was a long time ago. Uh, I thought it was neat, you know? That's basically it, you know? I. <laughs> You know, I was, it was one of my f earlier investments. I didn't really have a good investor thesis at the time, if you will. I was just like, oh, it's kind of cool. It looks pretty. It's a neat product that solves a problem people have. Um, you know, that's generally, I don't do a ton of investing. And when I do, it's generally in companies that, like, I would like to exist. You know, I, I, it's, I, I just, you know, it's easier for me to reason about. Um, you know, one of my favorite investments is this company called E. Carte. They do like they have like a tablet you have at restaurants, and you could split bills and order new things from that sort of thing. Because I hate bad service in restaurants, and I think this tablet helps alleviate some of that. Um, I was basically sitting next to him at a Y Combinator dinner, and I was like, "Hey, what are you working on?" Because I was really bored. And during some other guy's presentation, and he's like, "Oh, I'm working on this Elecart thing." I was like, "Oh my gosh, I'm in!" Because this is a company I thought about a lot, and I really wanted to do. So that's usually when I invest, just because like, "Oh, I'd like that to exist," or I wanted to do that myself, but I can't because I'm doing Hitmonk. So. I'll throw some of my own money at it. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, as well, I know a lot of engineers who like to tell funny stories. I was wondering if you happen to have any particularly interesting development moments that you can share with me that I'd like to have a Sure, sure, sure. Um, he asked if I have any like good development moments. Um, we've had a lot of interesting ones over the years. So let me see if I can remember one off the top of my head. Um, Oh, you know, one of the tricky things, we had a, a tricky one at Reddit where um, I was trying to scale the database. And so we had one database, and then I basically 
you know, it was too much load for one, so I, we, we added a read slave so we could do reads from both machines, you know, to alleviate some of the load. Um, but the problem is, like, when you're, when you're doing this, you can only write to one database, and the data has to propagate to all the other little slaves, um, which takes time. And so at Reddit, you would submit a link, and then we'd immediately redirect to a, the comment page for that link after you submit it. The problem is, we'd submit the link, we'd redirect to that comment page, and then um, Reddit would hit the read slave and be like, give me the comments for this link that was created milliseconds ago and hasn't propagated yet. Um, and so he'd get a 404. And, that, and so users were complaining about these, like, I submit a link and then it's 404, and then I go to investigate it, and it's working just fine because, like, a couple seconds have passed. And so that took me forever to figure out. Like, now it's, like, really obvious. And I, I've had other developers complain about these sorts of issues, and I'm like, oh, it's called replication lag. It's a really common problem. I just, like, didn't know about it because I was, you know, first time I'd ever done this. Um, so that one took a long time to figure out. Um, and it was, like, a very easy fix, but, you know. We had many, many, many moments like that, I feel like, at Reddit. Yeah? Favorite subreddit. Uh, I've answered this one many times. It's Circle Jerk. Circle Jerk's great. Yeah, in the back. Oh, yeah. OK, great question. So he asked me, when we sold Reddit, what was the moment I knew it was closed? So like I was telling you, um, this acquisition was really painful. It took months. I was in a bad state, Alexis was in a bad state, Aaron was shut off in his room. We were just like negotiating, negotiating, negotiating. Um, and the deal almost blew up a number of times um, over various things. It's very like just up and down, up and down. Um, it wasn't the day we signed, it was the day before. Um, I think I had gotten a call from our lawyer. I was, in, I was sitting in my room where I, at my desk and our lawyer called and basically told me um, the documents are signed, money's in escrow. I mean, the documents aren't signed. The documents, everybody's agreed on it. There's no more changes. And I remember just like crying on the phone. Like I hung up and I just sat there and I just like wept because it was just like this release of all this like stress that had been like kind of holding me down, I think. Or just like this, 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 I don't know, this feeling of oppression that I've been carrying for the past few months was just relieved. Um, it was such a cathartic feeling. And then, the next day when we actually signed the documents, it was pretty anticlimactic. So I think I had just like, uh, I was just emotionally, like I had gotten all the emotions out the day before by myself. Um, but it's just kind of a moment where you're sitting there thinking, man, my life's never going to be the same. You know, that was, that was, pretty, that was pretty wild. It was pretty heavy. Um, you know, and it did. My life hasn't been the same, right? It fundamentally changed my life. Um, but yeah, it, it's, you don't really know until you're there, I guess. Um, so she's, she asked, you know, what's my basically favorite way to chill out? Um, there are a couple of things I like to do. Mostly I just like to, like to spend time with my friends and laugh. I feel like that's a very, it's a very, you know, I mean, you all have friends, right? I assume. If you don't, you should get some. They're great. Um, <laughs> you know, so like, um, yeah, mostly that. You know, we could be doing anything. Um, you know, but mostly I just like being around similar people and just laughing and having a good time. Um, I love skiing, went through a motorcycle racing phase, that was tons of fun. Like, there's a lot of like high adrenaline stuff that's like nice, it reminds me that like there's more to life than sitting behind a computer. Um, so that sort of stuff is really cool too. Yeah. Why are hotel bookings <laughs> Because the hotels are, have high margins. Airlines barely stay in business. Um, their margins are very, very thin, so they don't like giving money away because um, they don't have any to give. Um, I mean, airlines are perpetually going bankrupt. They're just not good businesses. Um, hotels, on the other hand, have massive margins, um, and they're a simpler business to run. You know, they don't fly around. They don't have fuel costs, all those sorts of things. So basically, it's just a side effect of the fact that hotels have really, really high margins and are... Um, simpler businesses to run, so they pay us more. So there's more competition for those users too, right? So, yep. I think we have time for one more question. So. Okay. Choose wisely. <laughs> All right, Chris, yeah, what's up? Yeah. 
Okay, question is, do you think there's a way to fix an airline? Um, no. <laughs> I mean, not right now. I think there, there are things holding airlines back. Um, you know, we can get into the politics of that. You know, I think unions are very troublesome for them. I think the regulations are very troublesome for them. Although sometimes they like them, sometimes they don't. But fundamentally, like, what they're doing is very, very complicated. And fuel costs are very, very high. So if fuel costs come down, or maybe they make solar-powered planes, or some way of just basically, you've got to make it cheaper or get people comfortable spending a lot more money on flights. Because back in the day, most planes were actually basically like first class service. People, like, you know, airlines have competed themselves into being a commodity, so the fact that like I can just fly from San Francisco to State College is like, okay, yeah, I'll do that, no big deal. But like 50 years ago, that's a big freaking deal. Um, and users would, or customers, excuse me, would pay a lot of money to do that. Um, now I just expect it to be possible, and so, uh, but I think until it becomes a lot cheaper to run an airline, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be painful. So trains, trains. Um, all right, well, I guess that's it. So thank you guys very much. That was a lot of fun.